I am uh, Gérard Moreau. I'm from France. And uh, my field is laser. Well, I think I always believe that, you know, uh, science, you know, try to unify, I mean, should be used actually to unify people. Uh, and, and I'm a strong believer in this. And uh, it's like music, you know, and everybody speaks the same language. In science, the same thing. In science, we all speak the same language, you know. And we work on the same problems, and we try to make this world better. Well, uh, the passion of light, in fact, comes from the laser. The first time I've seen the lasers, I say, wow, I couldn't believe, you know, well, to, to see this light so well behaved. This beam of light, you know, very with kind of a pure colors and so on, that was very captivating for me and kept me on going for 45 years. Yeah, of course, you know, the uh, combination of a career, you know, uh, as a physicist is winning the Nobel Prize. And then when you get this phone call from Stockholm, I knew, of course, that the Nobel Prize for Physics is always given on um, the first Tuesday of uh, October. And, um, so, and before, before noon, you know, so. And I was kind of, uh, you know, waiting, you know, waiting even if I had a small chance, you know, I was, you know, was waiting and also interested to, to know who was going to get it. But um, anyway, I'm a avid swimmer, so I was on my way to go to the swimming pool. And my, my secretary just waved at me, said, Georges, could, could you come back? You have, we have a phone call for you from Sweden, you know, from Stockholm. Oh, wow, I said, well, is that? Pugliet. And so I picked up the phone and, of course, um, yeah, it was coming from Stockholm, you know, and so I uh, almost crashed because it's so, it's, it's dynamite <laughs> when you hear it. And that changed, and that changed your life also. Oh, this has been extremely relevant. Um, one thing I've done, we, we have in, invented a new type of laser with Donna Strickland, my co laureate and student. We invented a, a lasers, and um, in the process of aligning the laser, my student, not Donna, but another student, got the beam in his eyes. And so we took the, uh, the students, he was not wearing goggles like he was supposed to, but, you know, accident happened. And so we took him to the, the hospital where uh, uh, he saw an ophthalmologist, you know, and the ophthalmologist looked in his eyes, his retina, and so on. And he said, hmm. Yeah, you got the laser in your, in your eye, in your retina. Your retina is burned. But he said, but what type of laser is it? And the student said, you know, he told him that it was a new type of laser. He said, and he asked him, why are you asking these questions? Well, because your, the damage you have in your eye is perfect. And that, you know, started what now is femtosecond ophthalmology. There is millions of people now 
using the femtosecond laser for surgery. You know, so it was very clearly a mistake. You know, it was not planned at all. That opened up a completely uh, uh, new field, and you have millions of uh, people who are benefiting from from this application now. This is very close to my heart. All the environmental issue, I will say, is on my the top, you know, of my uh, of my um, um, preoccupations. Because uh, we see every day, of course, you know, that of course we are science brings a lot of course technology, how brings technology and also, but now it is. Science, I, we invented, if I'm, in fact, a new terms for this type of science, should be toilet science. Do you understand? Toilet science. Now, because some science, some of the science, you know, help to destroy the, uh, the planet with all the technology that came out of that. So we should really now think about a really cleaning the mess, basically, which has been done. We have to say that, you know, as a consequence of uh, in some uh, new science and technology. I, I would say, um, yes, we have to be very careful about what we do. I think it's, uh, of course, you, you know, you have sci sciences, and then you have the engineers and technologies, and then you uh, have um, products and so on, and, 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 and consumers and so on. Uh, so I think uh, f for scientists, we really need to discover work on improving, cleaning the planet, for instance, in nuclear power, for instance, you know, uh, nuclear powers, we have all this nuclear waste. So we, we are working, you know, uh, with lasers on trying to basically uh, improve the situations. Because nuclear energy is certainly a very, you know, a very important source of energy which could be very clean at one condition. We have to clean up the West after that. So if we come up with reasonable solutions to clean up the West, then, then that would be fantastic improvement. Well, the scope for uh, lasers is enormous. It's enormous, okay? You know, uh, in 1960, the laser was demonstrated by Ted Mayman, but it was invented by um, Towns. And uh, as soon as the laser was invented, people were saying, you know, what's going to be the use of this laser? So they, they tried to find applications, you know, uh, for the lasers. They try to find application. In fact, when we also demonstrated the very ultra high intensity lasers um, that we got the price for, uh, also we were not sure about the applications. And now they, they were, we have, of course, enormous amount of applications, you know. And what I like, of course, yes, is applications in the medical, in medicine, and so on. That is, will be uh, very, is very important. It's on the top of my agenda. My, I, I think I have only one advice for really students who would like really to get into uh, uh, science and research and all that. You have to be passionate. If you don't, if you are not passionate about it, you know, you should do something else. It has to come from the heart of your, because it's very hard. 
you know, it's very hard for you, but also for me, also I have to say for the family, because you are always thinking about your research, because you are passionate. So you are thinking only about one thing, you know. And so some, some, sometimes it's, it's tough for, uh, for the people who are with you, you know. I mean, the type of, I mean, the type of um, quality you need, you know, of course, is the ability to endure, you know, being long time in the lab and be, be, uh, be patient and obstinate, you know, you have to be focused. Oh, my swimming is very important. I'm swimming, well, I'm a skier, you know, I, I was born in the, the French Alps, you know, in a, this town which is named Albertville, and uh, where we had the Olympic Games. And, um, uh, and so skiing, you know, it's basically a natural thing for me, but also uh, I love uh, swimming. Swimming for me is like a yoga, you know, you, it's, it's a very, um, it's, it's peaceful, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about open water swimming, okay? And I love that. That's right. And I have a problem because when I, th I think about this, when I think about because I'm, I'm feeling you're in a state when you're swimming. You're in a state of, um, yeah, you are relaxed, totally relaxed. But also you're thinking about your research. And that's a problem because I, sometimes I forget the number of laps I'm doing, you know. Well, you know, I, um, because my dad was in a, working in the electrical power companies, you know, in the Alps, the French Alps. And um, so it was always, we were always, at the, always talking about current power, amperes, voltage, and things like, you know, he had that transformers and all that, because this is what he was doing. And I was, uh, in, in, in a way, you know, he was always explaining to me how they were working. Yeah, with my dad, you know, we were playing chess and doing, uh, I mean, learning about uh, physics, yes. Yeah, you know, I mean, working with graduate students is like, uh, with your family, being with really your family. I mean, that's the way I always treated my students. We, we stay in the labs together, we discuss in the lab, we, you know, the weekends we spend together and so on. I mean, always thinking about what we want to achieve. And, uh, and that brings, brings the students and, and, and and, and the um, uh, faculty together, you know, the, we are aging, you know, the faculty is aging, but we renewed, you know, the students are renewed. <laughs> so we are always close to the very, very young students. Mm -hmm. And I'm very pleased also that many of my students, um, few of my students, well, many, you know, about 10, will be attending the the Nobel lectures and, and so on, the events. Since the very beginning, I was very attracted by trying to, to really produce very, very short pulses. Uh, short pulses in, at the beginning it was the picosecond and then femtosecond and then add two seconds and so on. So uh, picosecond is 10 minus 12, 
you know, is one thousandth of a billionth of a second. And a picosecond is, um, or femtosecond is a, a, f a billionth of a millionth of a second. Okay? And I, I was always fascinated by what we could do because it's, it's a, you could really do for the, we could really for the first time, we could, you could see things moving in these time scales. And of course, we are not moving in these time scales. But molecules, atoms, electrons, and all that, they move in this time scale. And of course, your eye is too slow you know, to follow them. So trying to understand the world with this new tool, this tool of having very short pulses so you can track down you know, uh, the evolutions of a very small systems uh, to understand reactions and that. This is, was, is, is, is really extremely fascinating. Then came the second applications. And the second application, if, if you are producing these very, very short pulses, then you can produce, if you are smart, you can produce very, very high intensity, very high peak power. And this is where we have the problem with Dana, is the fact because the power, but you, because the pulses are short, the power that we are trying to get can be very high. But at one point, you are breaking down the laser because the power, the peak power is too high. And that's, of course, clamp, clamp uh, down the laser power that you can produce. And it's where we come, came up with uh, Donna with this idea of CPA, which is chirp pulse amplification, which could circumvent these problems of the laser being destroyed as we were amplifying the pulse and getting more peak power in the pulse. My Nobel Prize was awarded, you know, because of my work with lasers, with very, very short pulse lasers. And why do, you, what, why do you want to have very, very short pulse lasers? Is because these pulses will be also important for communications, very important for, telecom, for communication in general, very important also in the medical world, very important for many other disciplines. And because, because with this, these very short pulses, you will be able really to, to observe or to track down, you know, reactions which happen in cells, but also which may happen also in a transistor, for instance, you know, for communication, fast electronics and so on. And also because they will be, they, this very short pulse gives you the ability to produce, over a very short times, extremely high peak power. So you can use that for nuclear physics and maybe also trying to understand events which are happening in the cosmos. Because you can really produce the highest temperature, the highest pressure, the highest field, the highest gravity, so you can, you can really simulate and bring back into the lab what is happening in the cosmos and in life in general. Mm -hmm.